Um, thank you so much for being here today. I'm Becky Maddox, the Executive Director here of the Phoenix Center. It's wonderful to see so many of our local partners here from Greenville today, as well as um, a lot of our state South Carolina partners as well. So thanks to everybody for coming here today. So exciting, isn't it? The governor's in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, when you work in this field of substance use, um, it's usually because you have a personal story attached to um, substance use. Um, some of you know this, but I lost my dad 30 years ago, um, just over, and I've lost quite a few of my other family members, unfortunately, to this disease of substance use disorder. And I know that quite a few of you in this room have lost folks that you care about as well. And it's not just a South Carolina problem, of course. Um, we've got folks from all over the country who've lost people that they care about. And that's really why we're all here today. So thank you for being here. Um, sometimes as individuals, we feel powerless to address this problem of substance use disorder. But when we work together, we feel stronger and less isolated. It's nice to know that we're not the only ones who experience this pain. In Greenville, we have a wonderful network of community partners who support one another and work collaboratively to prevent substance use, to treat those who are affected by substance use, and help families heal and recover. Specifically related to opiates, that's kind of what we're here to talk about a little bit today. Our Greenville County partners have worked together to provide medication-assisted treatment, provide access to Narcan to prevent overdose deaths. We provide um, prenatal care to pregnant women who are using opiates and not able to stop um, while they're pregnant to reduce the risk to the baby and the mom. Um, we have recovery coaches in our emergency department, thanks to Favor and GHS and other folks who, um, who saw the need and found folks who would fill that need. Um, we have prevention services throughout our community through lots of different um, organizations. We have coalitions of folks who are totally committed to helping um, those of us who struggle with substance use. We have our ECHO Coalition here in Greenville also that specifically works on creating a change with prescription drugs and the misuse that sometimes comes with that. I'm really pr proud to be a part of a community that cares so much about its residents. Thanks again to all of you, our local partners here in Greenville and surrounding counties. I see quite a few of you here as well. We are changing and saving lives together, and I thank you for that. I'm also proud of the work that our legislators are doing on our behalf with the support of our governor. And I'd like to welcome Representative Russell Fry to highlight some of their incredible work from this year. Thank you for being here. I will be brief. Um, I know Representative Henderson, excuse me, <clears throat> will talk about some of the bills that, that we pass and some of the policies, but um, I want to thank that this was a huge team effort. And we had stakeholders, we had legislators, the Senate, um, the governor, all hands on deck dealing with this problem throughout South Carolina. What started a year and a half ago has turned into, at this point, 15 policy proposals that the governor has signed and an incredible amount of effort and dedication to this issue in South Carolina. Um, we started about a year and a half ago. We had a press conference. Um, I still remember it vividly. I was actually watching a video this morning of it. And I said there, and I think we all looked at this, that no community in this state um, is beyond the opioid epidemic. Everyone is affected by, by, this, by this crisis. 600 people approximately in South Carolina die each year from opioid addiction. That is a huge number. And it is incumbent on us in the legislature, it is incumbent upon 
the entire citizenry to deal with this fully and finally, and I hope that we are on that path today. Um, we took a comprehensive approach um, when the speaker formed the Opioid Task Force Committee um, in dealing with this crisis, from education, from treatment, to law enforcement, to the practice of medicine itself. We dealt in all aspects because there is not a one-size-fits-all approach to this problem. It takes a lot uh, of effort, it takes a lot of education, and I think because of those 15 bills that Governor McMaster has signed, um, we are on the right path to dealing with the opioid epidemic in South Carolina. Um, from budgetary requests too, we have a, a huge amount of money that have come in. Um, hopefully that budget will come soon, but we are very pleased with the progress and the focus on this issue in South Carolina. Um, it took a team approach. Um, it is really cool to stand up here and be a part of something that affects um, so many S South Carolinians and to be a positive force in, in changing the way that we deal with this problem in the state. And it wasn't me, it was a huge team approach. I want to thank the Senate um, for all their work, um, their proposals, the House members, um, my four or my three compatriots here that we, what started off as a really a coffee chat, so to speak, on how do we deal with this has really turned into a great opportunity in this state to address this problem and, and I couldn't be happier and I know Representative Henderson um, I would it has been aw awesome to take the mantle with you um, that, that was started by my colleague here Representative Bettingfield and all the work and, and I couldn't be prouder because at the end of the day this is about people this issue is about people and what we deal with is about people and so uh, I think when you do that that that's that's good government at work and it's something to be proud of so with, without further ado, my uh, partner and uh, awesome sweet mate in the, in the legislature, Phyllis Henderson, is going to explain some of the policy proposals that we had that we were able to get passed this year. Thank you. Thank you. Um. <clears throat> In the eight years I have been in the House, this is the most meaningful work that I have been involved in. I'm sorry, every time I say it, I can't help it, but um, what started as my friend Eric losing his son to an overdose, and um, I was involved in some national organizations that have been talking about this prescription drug issue, and I was on the Medical Affairs Committee at the time, and I thought, you know, this is something that I would like to look into more. And then it hit home because Eric lost his son, and just like Russell said, we all got together and started working on some things, and then our speaker set up a task force, and here we are um, celebrating what Russell said is about 15 pieces of legislation and a, and a, and a budget request. Um, I'll just give you a, a quick rundown on some of the things that we did. Back in 2017, we actually passed a bill that mandates that doctors and prescribers actually access a um, statewide database called our Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. And that means they have to check it before they write a prescription, and it also gives other people access to look at the data to be able to determine people's patterns and be able to maybe spot people that are doctor shopping or abusing the system. With that as a foundation, we moved into some other bills that everything from education requirements, requiring a, a portion of the high school health curriculum to include um, a conversation about substance abuse. Um, health care providers at the higher ed level now are required to include substance abuse disorder training in their curriculums. We actually passed a bill to license addiction counselors, which was something that the, the folks in this business you know, asked us to do, um, that it's gonna help improve that service. We did some things with drug take back, um, expanding the scope of people who are allowed to do drug take backs. We had a bill that requires a DHEC is working on something that we call a counterfeit resistant prescription drug blank. 
um, because that's one of the biggest problems also with this is, is counterfeit prescriptions, getting a hold on that. Um, we also had a very, um, you know, a really great bill on what we call the community distribution of Narcan or Naloxone. And that is allowing um, folks who work in the space of dealing with people um, in the community, mostly 501c3s, are now going to have the ability to carry Narcan and have it. Um, available for when they're dealing with folks and they have people that have a problem. Um, they don't have to call 911, they can have that. And um, lastly, but certainly not least, um, honestly a bill that uh, I got to thank the medical community. Um, I've been working with y'all for a couple years and I got to tell you in 2016 when we started talking about prescription, even the mandatory use of the database was like nobody wanted to talk about it but a a limit on initial prescriptions folks were like there's just no way we want to go there and over this process of years everybody um, in this space whether it be hospitals or pharmacies or retailers have all come on board and worked with us on um, what is now a bill that we passed um, limiting an initial prescription for opioids to five days um, that's something that I, I, I remember Eric and I talking about thinking, well, we're going we're gonna to put this in there, but we're not going to get this. And um, when we, we ended up getting it um, in, a, in a bill that Senator Peeler had in the Senate, um, we were like, wow, we really have come a long way. And we really have. And I want to thank everybody in this room that's been part of this group conversation because it's taken everybody in this field to come together and give and take a little bit and um, give their input about how we can solve this problem. So thank you. And uh, without further ado, I want to introduce my friend Eric Bedingfield. Come and say a few words. Well, it's interesting to be doing this and not be a representative anymore. So um, I just want to thank all the uh, everybody here from the medical community to um, our wonderful drug and alcohol abuse commissioners, our county councilman, our county council chairman, um, Sarah Goldsby. Love you. You know that. Um, what an incredible opportunity it was to. Uh, kind of realize and understand how people can come together and make things happen um, even when from your own standpoint it come from a place of tragedy um, losing my oldest son was honestly the worst <laughs> thing I could ever imagine as a parent um, but I have come to understand that the good that I could attempt to bring from this is a culmination of today's um, events. Um, just a desire to try to see to it that other families didn't have to suffer the same tragedies um, or that we put policies um, and opportunities in place that would allow people to see the light because there is light. You can recover um, from this disease um, as long as you continue to do uh, the things that are necessary to keep you uh, at a distance from the people and the substances that brought you to where you are. Um, one of my greatest hopes, other than just the legislative priorities that were laid out before you, was trying to find a way to remove the stigma that surrounds people who suffer from this illness and their families. Because what I found during my time of tragedy was that nobody wanted to talk about it. You know, nobody, nobody wanted to admit they had a family member that was in this position or that they were a parent who might have failed in some way. Um, but I'm here to tell you that if we don't talk about it, if we don't accept people who have seen this tragedy in their life, who are suffering from this disease, uh, then we are doing ourselves and those individuals a huge disservice. Um, the people who make up the addicted community are good, honest, hardworking people who never wanted to be where they are. 
Um, and if given a chance and an opportunity, like our community is coming together to offer, um, they are just as productive as you and I. And um, if we gain nothing else from, from what we have done, uh, but to allow people to have open, honest conversations, um, not only within their own families, but within their churches and within their communities about how you can get help, about how you can prevent yourself from being in this place to begin with, um, and how that you can bounce back when all is said and done, um, then we will have accomplished something. Um, but thank you for your time. Thank you for allowing me to serve for 12 years. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this effort with incredible people. Um, and most of all, thank you for your friendship. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. And I'd like to add my thanks to all those who've worked so hard on this because uh, we, we're making great progress, but this is this is a beginning. This is certainly not the end. It, it, it has, I think we've all learned that in order to make a solution, to come up with a response, we have to first know what the facts are. And it's, it's taken a while for us all to realize the facts. And once, once, you have, once you have the facts, you can come up with a solution. So it's, it's taken a while. But this epidemic and the response, I think, are both unique. This is a health crisis, but also a law enforcement crisis. That, that makes it a little different. But the health crisis, this is, this is one which, in part, was created from very well, by well-meaning intentions of overprescription of opioids. When opioids were being prescribed, it did not need to be prescribed, at least not in such abundance. And we've all heard stories of, of people saying they don't want to take those pills and they don't need so many, but they would be prescribed for them anyway. And we learned the fact that 52% of the opi illegal opioids out on the street <laughs> came out of somebody's medicine cabinet who didn't need all those pills and of course we've heard about the hijackers hijacking the trucks from the from the pharmaceutical companies and when the pharmaceutical companies would send the drugs out to the shipments out in unmarked vehicles they'd have the crooks would have the drones up chasing them to follow them wherever they're going so they could hijack them when they when they made the, the first stop but so it's unique in that part of this was created by very well intentions which we have now learned and now corrected, but the, the most exciting and comforting part of the whole thing is the response. I don't know of another challenge that our state has faced that has been met by the entire panoply of talent, understanding, professionalism, and organizations in the state. In this one, we have the doctors, the nurses, the health care, uh, community, the private institutions and organizations, law enforcement, the legislature, the political bodies at every level have all joined together. We have a human trafficking law and task force that was set up some time ago that is focusing on this. We have the uh, task force that the speaker set up. We have the task force and crisis recognition that I created with the executive order. We had also issued an executive order some time ago limiting to the extent that I could, which was just was limited to the state, to the uh, Medicaid, and then it was adopted by the state health plan to limit it to those five five days worth of prescriptions. But now a law has, has come in into place. So th this, is, this is a perfect example of what we can do when everybody works together. I don't know of a better one that I have ever seen than this one. And it is a good thing because this is a crisis unlike we have ever seen. Practicing law a number of years, the lawyers and maybe those who've been in court will remember when the jury venire is out there and the judges that you're going through the jury selection process, they have asked how many of you have been addicted to drugs or know someone that is addicted to drugs or a family member and a lot of hands would go up. 
Well, I'm just wondering how many hands would go up now because this opioid crisis has affected just about every, every family one way or another. So this is a good news day. This is a happy news day. And it also confirms what these business leaders from around the world are telling me why they want to come to South Carolina. As most famously stated just in, in Greenwood when Tejan came in with $600 million of investment and I th think 300 or 400 new jobs and they're planning on expanding. Uh, the lady that was leading the effort said that we're in South Carolina for three reasons. The people, the people, the people. And this is a good example of what we can do when we combine and attack a challenge. So this is good news. And my deepest thanks and congratulations to all of you who have played such a critical role. I don't believe we could have done it any better. But again, this is a beginning. We got a ways to go, but we have the tools. And as we use these tools, we'll find that there are more. So help's on the way. We're getting stronger every day. And thank you. Now let's, let's sign them up. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. 